welcome. Thank you for joining us this evening. It's lovely to see you here again. I recognize many of the names that are on here and we really appreciate you returning with us. My name is Eric and I'll be one of your four hosts on what is the first of a series that we're testing out, uh, a series that we're calling Bygone Bars, the story of American culture and camaraderie. We're looking to hit different eras, different neighborhoods and research some of the local hangouts where people gathered together and in some ways shape the world. Um, I would like to introduce some of our team that is here with us today. If our folks could turn on their cameras, was that the correct phrase? Open the cameras, unmute your cameras, start the video. We're having a little bit of a debate here on what the appropriate term is. Probably this. start. I like start. <laughs> start is good. It's like start, start your cameras. engines, start your, yeah. We're figuring it out. It's a whole new world here. This is something that we've been exploring uh, ever since the pandemic of doing our virtual tours. And, and we're slowly in the process of starting some new tours of actually in conversations now with the hopes of potentially starting soon in New York. If you're thinking about joining us when you see us go up on sale, as a reminder that currently uh, vaccinations are required to go into any bars and restaurants. And so proof needs to be with you. Uh, if you're local in New York City, you can get the Excelsior Pass, which is a great way to do it. Um, you can also use Clear for those of you who travel, and I'm not sure. I think that's a membership. Really? No kidding. Yeah, Clear. Yeah, it is a membership. Can, I didn't know you could use um, Clear. Huh. You can scan it. Actually, I mean, Clear is very smart about it because they they have all sorts of tickets that you can kind of connect with, and and they're really kind of pushing that side of it. So, um, or you can bring your printed copy, but that is a requirement for Broadway restaurants, museums, any any of the like. And hopefully, we'll see you out and about at one of those soon, and hopefully, we'll see you on one of our tours. Um, but uh, one of the things we really love about the virtual aspect, the presentation aspect of it, is we can cover a lot more ground. We're not, we're not limited to how far a person can walk and how long somebody can wait until they need to use the restroom, which is a, an actual problem we consider regularly when running a literary pub crawl. <laughs> uh, I never realized that I was going to become such an expert <laughs> on the average length of time one can hold one's bladder. Um, but to change the subject to something slightly more colorful, I wanted to introduce some of the members of the team. If you've been with us before, you probably recognize many of them, but at least in the view I have right above me would be Rose Merritt. Uh, she's been with us now. She's only actually been on two live tours. Is that right, Rose? You've been on the- Yeah, Brooklyn I think so. And the Village mm -hmm. Tour, we did a couple private tours, but you found us through the skint on one of our virtual tours and she she wanted to become a part of what we do and help out in the background she's been an absolutely huge asset and, and a wonderful person to bounce off of has some great ideas really helped elevate the show uh, and today she is participating for the first time as one of our guides beyond just running the powerpoint um, so she's going to learn a little bit of the trick of, actually we solved that becca will will switch we're going to do a powerpoint switch for those of you who are geeky PowerPoint people. Uh, but Rose works for a non-for-profit that uh, deals with leadership development in the global health industry. So she works with an organization that trains young professionals in how to become better health professionals and health professional leaders. Um, at the bottom of my stack uh, is of course, uh, Becca. Becca comes from my home state of Maine. Uh, she also is a graduate of my alma mater of University of Maine at Orno. She uh, okay. performed on Penobscot Theater Stages, which is a stage I performed upon, uh, despite the fact that there is a few years of an age difference here, but I, I know it's really hard to tell. <laughs> Just one <But>, or two. <laughs> all the same, she, uh, she joined us uh, when she moved down to the city to pursue an acting career. Uh, which uh, she's eagerly exciting to start pursuing again now that theaters are opening, but she also works for a law firm. So please be careful with what you say around Miss Becca. Uh, but she's been an absolutely wonderful contributor. She's been working in the background as well. And so she's been a great asset. Um, and then of course, lastly, uh, under, the, under the bridge, under the Hell's Gate Bridge, um, we have Justin. I'm the troll under the bridge. The troll under the bridge, thank you. Yes, I was trying to think of something, something nice to say. I was, I was like, you can't say anything nice, don't say anything at all. So I was applying that. <laughs> but with all that being said, I think, I think let's, um, let's raise a toast for those of you who uh, poured oh, yeah. us to enjoy with us here today. Um, we would like to thank you for coming and I'll share with you my favorite toast in all the world. And that is, here's to lying, cheating, stealing, and drinking. When you lie, lie to save a friend. When you cheat, cheat death. When you steal, steal the heart of another. And when you drink, think of us. And cheers. Cheers. We're going to start our bygone bars introduce introductory part one bar, uh, the Bohemian Rhapsody. Uh, and if you saw the graphic that Becca created, I, I was quite in love with that. But we're going to talk about some of the Bohemian bars of the Greenwich Village, which is where our flagship tour began. 
And we're going to start with a bygone bar that is sadly a recent bygone bar, but was a long time uh, member of our tour. Uh, we regretted when it collapsed. We were excited when it re reopened. We were saddened that the village fought hard to keep it from reopening. And now we are saddened again that it is gone. Uh, and that would be the illustrious 86 Bedford Street Chumleys. It's true. Chumley's at 86 uh, Bedford Street uh, was the location of uh, originally uh, called Chumley's Tea Shop. Um, it's hard to know exactly when Chumley's opened as an illegal drinking establishment selling moonshine, bathtub gin and other various hooch during prohibition. Uh, different sources claim different dates for when it opened. Um, but uh, we like to think that maybe that's by design. After all, when you're running something illegal, it helps not it helps to deny everything and get away with it when you're not actually writing anything down. So, um, so opening uh, sometime uh, during prohibition uh, by a man named Lee Chumley, uh, the bar, well, the tea shop uh, had many ways for the drunks, that is patrons uh, to sneak out if the police ever decided to stage a raid uh, between police raids uh, at Chumley's, you could enjoy a wide variety of special teas, uh, such as English tea, uh, gin, right, or 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 Jamaican Jamaican tea, please. Rum, yeah, or or an Irish tea, for example. <coughs> Whiskey, <clears throat> right? Among and you know, among many other types of teas. Uh, after Prohibition, it quickly became a hot spot for artists and writers of all kinds to gather and drink. Uh, decorating the walls were 400 book jackets of books purported to have been written uh, inside uh, on the tables. However, uh, there were a few exceptions, such as the jacket for the New Testament, which we assume was not written at Chumley's. Uh, it was further claimed that uh, over 40 Pulitzer Prizes and or Nobel Prizes um, uh, winning books, rather, were written in the bar. Some um, uh, some of the more regular, uh, notable regulars uh, include, for example, Orson Welles. Um, he allegedly started his work on Citizen Kane at Chumley's. Um, he, uh, he started it and then uh, went to uh, London to finish it. But uh, while he was at Chumley's, he would often sleep uh, in the bar as well. And apparently when he finally left town, he left an outstanding bar tab of $1,500. And that's when beer was a nickel. So that comes out to roughly 30,000 beers, you which, you man, know, he's a big, <laughs> right. He's a big like man. He he's a big man. Beers. He could do, yeah, he could do 30,000 beers over, over, you know, a he short while. you to criticize um, it. Go ahead. Say something. <laughs> Go ahead. Right? I know. He's I drank so, beer. so serious. What have you done with your life? <laughs> <laughs> so F. Scott Fitzgerald and his wife, Zelda, had their wedding reception at Chumley's. Uh, Zelda's family was considered a kind of Southern aristocracy in a way. And so they weren't too pleased when their daughter decided to marry uh, a writer, a, an Irishman, uh, a drunk and a Yankee, um, all wrapped up into F. Scott Fitzgerald. So there are rumors that they consummated their marriage on a table in the bar that night. But more research that we found claims that uh, what really happened was uh, F. Scott consummated a different relationship uh, on another night doing <laughs> at that table. Uh, Steinbeck, uh, also a regular, a big supporter of the theater, adapted several books into, into plays, and, and you could find a couple of, book, of his book jackets uh, up on the wall at, at Chumley's. Uh, Margaret Mead, a famous anthropologist of the 50s, was a regular at Chumley's. She won a claim for researching and writing Coming of Age in Samoa, which later came under scrutiny because of rumors that she fabricated uh, her work. However, what seems to have happened was that she did, in fact, go to the South Pacific uh, to research coming of age in Samoa, but the natives um, were kind of pulling her leg and having a bit of fun with her, um, making up things like mating rituals and ceremonies, and she dutifully recorded everything. So either way, we'd like to think that if she made up all her data in, for that book, that she did that at Chumley's as well. Uh, in 1968, at the table in the front corner, uh, which is the only uh, was the only table that got natural light, uh, Robert Kennedy sat and wrote his presidential platform. Uh, the story goes that he was convinced to run at the lion's head, and then he walked over to Chumley's uh, to work it all out. Edna St. Vincent Millay was a regular as well, uh, and it's said that she'd often have too many gin and tonics, that was her drink, but she would have too many gin and tonics and would be eagerly walked home by her friends, as uh, her romantic life was very well known and summed up uh, probably, probably, 
very accurately summed up, summed up by two of her more famous short poems. Thursday. And if I loved you Wednesday, well, what is that to you? I do not love you Thursday. So much is true. And why you come complaining is more than I can see. I loved you Wednesday, yes. But what is that to me? Nice. First fig. My candle burns at both ends. It will not last the night. But ah, my foes and oh, my friends, it gives a lovely light. <laughs> And, and I just want to nice. acknowledge that was not only Rose's uh, first time participating in the tour, but the first time reciting a poem on the tour. So thank you, Rose. Lovely. Uh, Vincent, as uh, Edna St. Vincent Millay also insisted on being called, uh, got her first recognition in 1912. At the age of 20, she entered her poem Renaissance into a poetry contest, and her poem was awarded fourth place and then published in, an, in a journal. The first place winner was a poet named Oric Johns for his poem Second Avenue. However, when Johns saw the compiled publication, he wrote the following. Quote, when the book arrived, I realized that it was an unmerited award. The outstanding poem was Renaissance. The award was as much an embarrassment as a triumph. And he refused to attend the dinner to receive his award in protest. Uh, in 1921, Vincent published A Few Figs from Thistles, in which she described female sexuality in such a way that gained her quite a, a bit of attention. She put forth the idea that a woman uh, has every right to sexual pleasure and no obligation to, to fidelity, at the time very scandalous. And she was, uh, she was also a master of the sonnet, uh, wrote many sonnets, and oftentimes people will read one of her sonnets and confuse it with Shakespeare's. Uh, the Chumleys of Old, uh, closed suddenly uh, in April of 2007 when a chimney collapsed, making the building unsafe. It was then renovated and reopened in 2016, uh, but sadly closed for good earlier this year. It is sad, and it was a bit of a loss. And in fact, there was kind of a fun afternoon where we were frantically uh, trying to bid on some of the belongings, including <laughs> right here and right here. The ones right behind. Successfully went, oh, you can see my hand in the reflection of Joe Gould. That's Joe Gould. That is Miss Edna Malay. These were actually hanging inside the bar at Chumley's. Uh, there are others. Uh, my mom is on the tour, so I won't admit how much I spent on all of this paraphernalia. Uh, <laughs> however, there is a lot of literary merit to what is going on. And of course, mom and I both Eric. Rockland, Maine for a while, as did Edna Malay. Yes, Justin. Eric, do you remember Do you remember the, the, the week and then the, the several weeks after Chumley's first closed in 2007? We were finding regulars that we knew from Chumley's we were finding them in other bars. It was like, it was like all these people got displaced and then they just weren't sure where to drink anymore. And every time we walked into some place, cause they knew who we were, we had been going there for years. And so we would see each other and it was like long lost friends. It was wild. Every week, this happened for weeks. We would walk into another, I remember this, we'd walk into another bar and people would look at us and like everybody's eyes would like get wide and then like a little misty and we'd be, oh, hello, how are you? You know, how's it going? What's happening? I don't know. I don't know where I'm going. I'm just drinking here and finding out where the, what I'm going to do. And yeah, it was wild. People were it was, talking. It was, it just, it was a real reverberation. You know? Yeah, the drunken diaspora of 2007. I mean, there really was yeah. migration. <laughs> Uh, to other pubs right. on Saturday afternoon. Yeah, it was, uh, it was yeah, it was weird. Well, of course, Justin, you you bear the distinguished honor of being one of the last two people to have a drink in Chumleys. Is that correct? That is very that is very true. The pictures that are that are behind Eric from Chumleys, I went to go get it with uh, with another fellow guide um, who is a published author now, uh, Marissa. And Marissa and I went in and we took down the the pictures that we bought and and everything else. And then before we left, Marissa looked at me and said, I have some Jameson's in my backpack. You want to be the last people to have a drink at Chumley's? And I was like, totally. And so we walked over to the bar and we dusted off all the, there was dust and stuff on the bar as the workers were literally stripping uh, stuff off the walls. And she poured two shots and we had a drink and and then walked out of Chumley's with our loot, with our stuff. I was seething with envy. And it was like right in the height of pandemic. And I have two little girls. And I sat there looking at the cost of a plane ticket to fly out there. <laughs> like, is, this, is this wise? If there was no pandemic, 
I, I'm sorry, right. mom. I would have spent the money, but because of the <laughs> pandemic, like, I have to be a good dad, <laughs> which is so early on in the process. But um, Freya, Freya doesn't need a fourth, a fourth year of college. She could probably exactly, finish right? it in three years, right? Yeah, you don't need to invest that money for any reason. Exactly. She doesn't need both of her lungs. We have to reason. Um, well, you know, one of the That's reasons right. redundant kidneys. Uh, why Chumley's was really successful uh, to be able to masquerade as a tea shop during Prohibition, despite the fact that it does seem like a fairly silly cover story, is is partially due to the fact that the tea room craze that was happening in the U.S. in the few years leading up to Prohibition was huge. In fact, Greenwich Village was one of the biggest epicenters of the tea room fanaticism, uh, and one such tea room was opened by a sculptress by the name of Edith Unger. And this is sort of a, a real sort of historic back look at uh, Greenwich Village bars. Um, she established the beloved Mad Hatter in 1916. Uh, it's in the basement of what is now the Washington Square Diner. Um, it's believed by some to be the very first tea room, at least in Greenwich Village, if not in New York City. Um, this is what it is now, uh, to give you a sense, um, far from uh, feeling historic, uh, literary, cultural, or even inviting for that matter. Uh, although that guy <laughs> in his double suspenders, oh no, that's a satchel. Um, but he's gonna eat some really good eggs. Um, but the, the real historic view is this next shot here. Um, and uh, what you can't tell, actually, if you go back once, Rose, sorry, throwing a PowerPoint twist, um, you can see where the tables and chairs are. What they've done is they've closed over what used to be the basement entrance. So if you can go to the next slide again, you can see that was where you went sort of down the rabbit hole, so to speak. Uh, and in fact, that is down the rabbit hole written backwards. Um, and the photo is a, a photo by a woman named Jessie Tarbox Beals. I'm trying to say that five times fast, Tarbox Beals. Um, she herself was a village resident of this time, uh, had a, her own shop and took s some of the most iconic photos of the 19 teens in Greenwich Village. Um, I mean, she really, uh, um, she, she was one of the first professional photo journalists as a woman. Um, which is kind of excited. And she really, really captured the feel. And you're going to see a bunch of her shots that we're going to share throughout some of these, these bars because she really kind of captured the village. And in fact, she was, she was uh, listed in a guidebook as the official photographer of Bohemian Greenwich Village. Uh, now, 1916, when this bar was opened, was a big year for Edith uh, because she was also well known for her theatrical costume designs, uh, mostly for the Provincetown players. And if you've been on our tour or on some of us previous uh, um, virtual tours, you've probably heard us mention the Provincetown Players. They're really kind of the first breakaway off-Broadway theater in New York. And they started performing up in Provincetown, Massachusetts. And then they met uh, a playwright um, who would eventually become one of the regulars of the Mad Hatter. It would be the legendary literary icon, Eugene O'Neill. Um, in fact, his New York debut came from the Provincetown Playhouse, with the performance of his short play, Bounties for Cardiff. It was one of three that performed in 1916, probably a handful of weeks before or after Edith opened this. And if you've been on our virtual tours, you know that this slide might be a personal favorite of, of mine. Now, obviously the name of the Mad Hatter comes from the fact of uh, Lewis Carroll's classic novel uh, based off of its most memorable character in that book. Um, but the term Mad Hatter was not coined by Carroll. I'm sure all of us know, uh, for those of us who have endeavored in making a man's hat in the early 1800s, that in order to make a man's hat, you do need, yes, Rose, I, I saw her hand up. We do need to separate the beaver pelt from the beaver fur or the rabbit felt from the rabbit fur in an act that is known as carroting. I'm sure many of us have done some carroting at home on our own. Uh, who hasn't? Carroting. Who hasn't, exactly. Um, now, in the 1800s, the best method to do this was to use mercury as a substance to sort of help rub and clean this off. It was a main ingredient in the process. Now, shockingly, mercury inhalation and ingestion has been attributed to causing all sorts of uh, bad physical activities and uh, syndromes, including Korsakoff's syndrome, uh, having a big effect on the brain with amnesia, personality changes, confabulation, and confusion. And since hat makers worked in places with poor ventilation, many of these traits became common with hat makers. And there are a few warning signs to know if someone perhaps have had a little bit too much mercury inhalation. Uh, but because it was so common for hatters, the term mad as a hatter or the mad hatter came from this lovely activity. Uh, there's a couple of fun quotes to give you a sense of what life was like in the Mad Hatter in the 1916s. Um, one guidebook quoted has said, here commercialism, even in the part of the proprietors, scarcely existed. Meals were written on the cuff, 
never to be erased, but all true villagers were welcome so long as they kept the conversation flowing well into the night. Uh, another description was 18 persons crowded it. Another one said that the walls of the back room were covered with drawings by various artists and nearly all represented scenes from Alice in Wonderland. Um, and then one of my favorites talked about a pot of coffee simmering in the back stove. An ice cream freezer stands just outside the back door and cakes and bread and tea and muffins and jam appear from somewhere when called for. Toast also appears, but about half the time it is forgotten, put in the oven, and eventually it ceases to be toast. Then somebody smells it and the process begins again. Now, uh, publications remarked about the villagers who were coming there, uh, saying they're true gentlemen and true gentlewomen. Uh, there was a haze of tobacco and a cheery greeting, uh, all under the flickering light of candles, whose guttering in some cases have completely hidden the candlesticks that hold them. Um, before long, Eliza uh, would uh, hire a fascinating woman by the name of Eliza Helen Criswell. Now, Helen Criswell um, was a graduate of Bryn Mawr College. Did I say it right? Bryn Mawr? Bryn Mawr? Mawr. Bryn, Bryn, Bryn Mawr. I'm from, I'm from Maine, so these are hard. We have lobsters, chowders, and Bryn Mawr College. Um, but uh, she was fairly comfortable with her sexuality, which was not necessarily aligned with the norms of the time. Uh, and so she cut herself into a, a cut herself. She, she cut her hair into a more uh, feministly revolutionary bobbed haircut uh, and started insisting on being called Jimmy James or Jim. So Jimmy Criswell took a part-time job with the Mad Hatter to supplement her income teaching. Uh, and eventually uh, uh, she gave away shoes for sandals, uh, took to wearing artsy smarts, smarts, artsy smocks, artsy smocks, um, and uh, really became uh, the most iconic uh, uh, hostess of, of the Mad Hatter and began running it on her own. Um, in fact, she described herself once in, in an issue of a magazine that she was Cheerfully, the cook, cashier, waiter, bouncer, busboy, checkroom boy, official chaperone, arbiter, elegantarium, chess scorer, peacemaker, drainage system, bookkeeper, cat nurse, censor, and goat of said coffee house. So she certainly did it all. Now, of course, near the end of the Mad Hatter's time, uh, she, as were many uh, villagers, complaining about the fact that there were a lot of slummers coming down, people from the upper or middle classes, from respectable neighborhoods coming to the village to see the bohemians in their crazed activities. Um, in fact, one uh, article, Jimmy Criswell moaned, lady slummers who read the Ladies Home Journal are swamping us, and later noted that quartets of old ladies infested the front room. And I think it's really interesting to know at that time that uh, elderly ladies always seem to gather in quartets. Um, and no trios. No trios. If you saw a quintet, quintet, one of them was probably not with us for long. Um, <laughs> it's true. It's true. These are all truth. Everything we say is the truth. I don't know why I say some of the things I say. They just come out. Your bathroom is down the house in the house that you have. Despite the intrusions of non-villagers, the artistic set continued to call the Mad Hatter home. Um, but apart from uh, Eugene O'Neill, you had Sinclair Lewis, Lewis Mumford, the ever popular Gish sisters, who doesn't have some of their work at home, uh, poet Harry Kempt, and the journalist Hendrik Willem van Loon. Um, but while Edith brought its art and culture to the Hatter and Jimmy expanded that with a strong sense of bohemianism, the revolutionary bobbed haircut and gending bender personae, that style of revolutionary feminist anarchy was far from unique to the village, even in 1916, which we will get into mo momentarily, but I would love to end to pay some homage to the Mad Hatter and of course the iconic bit which is a quick little quip from Alice Car uh, from Lewis Carroll's Alice in Wonderland. Alice asked the Cheshire cat who was sitting in a tree, what road should I take? The cat asked, well, where do you want to go? I don't know, Alice answered. Then said the cat, it really doesn't matter, does it? And those are words to live by. It really doesn't <laughs> matter, does it? Nothing matters. <laughs> and that's, what, that, that's our takeaway. Here at the pub crawl, all, always remember. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Thanks for that thanks for coming. Really yeah. <laughs> Speaking of roads, <laughs> we are going to mosey on down the road towards Washington Square Park, and we're going to hook a right, and we're going to go back to 1913, just a few years prior, on 137 McDougal Street. Now, three artists in the village at this time decided to open up a restaurant here. It came to be known as Polly's Restaurant or Cafe or The Basement or even Greenwich Village Inn. It really depended on whom you spoke to at the time or where the location was, who had the, uh, the inside scoop. 
Now, something that made this restaurant extra special was that it was run by Bohemians for Bohemians. The first being its namesake, Paula Polly Holiday. She was born in Chicago, a frontier woman, if you will. Uh, she was actually referred to as a frontier woman in some articles. Um, she was also a writer and an anarchist. And then her brother, Louis Holiday, who was BFF of Eugene O'Neill. We've seen him here before, folks. Here he is again. Um, and also, if you are a Eugene O'Neill fan, you should look into Lewis Holiday. There's a lot of fascinating stuff about their relationship. And after Lewis's death, a lot of changes in Eugene's work and his life choices. Um, so definitely look into that. He was also an anarchist. And then we had Hippolyte Havel. Now, he was a Czech-American anarchist and supposedly Polly's occasional lover and also a friend of Eugene O'Neill just like pretty much everyone else on this tour. Um, O'Neill actually based the character of Hugo Kalmar in the Iceman Comet off of Hippolyte. And Hugo is essentially this passed out drunk during the play who only wakes up to like rage on, sing and yell, the days grow hot, oh Babylon. Now, Hippolyte claimed to have come up with the idea for the spot himself um, to build this village bistro where radicals could dine together and discuss la revolution. He also worked as a cook and at times the sole waiter and he also gained, uh, gained great notoriety for yelling at patrons upon entry and calling them bourgeois pigs. He was known for a lot of yelling basically. Sounds like O'Neill didn't stray too far from the truth. No, not even a little bit. And fortunately, what Hippolyte lacked in niceties, he made up for in his ideas. Polly's was an instant hit. Um, it attracted the artistically minded as well as the socially and the politically active, such as Emma Goldman, Theodore Dreiser, Sherwood Anderson, Max Eastman, Catherine Susan Anthony, the list goes on, Eugene O'Neill, of course. They were all regulars here. Now, Polly's only lasted at this particular location for a couple of years before it moved on to more commercial spaces. As you heard Eric talking about before, there was an appeal to the Bohemian lifestyle. So it ended up across the street from Mad Hatter for a little while, and then later on Sheridan Square, just growing larger and drawing in all of these tourist crowds who wanted that village artist experience that they'd read all about in the papers, uh, to the great dismay of the true Bohems, of course. But before it sold out, as they say, this original location represents the quintessential bohemian lifestyle in the village. It aided in the transition from the closed doors of editorial rooms and private homes and salons to more public meeting spaces. It was an early LGBTQ hangout. It was a hotbed for women's rights, which we are going to dive into shortly. And it also just offered a place for progressive minds to convene and challenge societal norms. Who doesn't want that? So 137 McDougal in particular was a two for one special because Polly's restaurant was down in the basement, but then upstairs you had the liberal club. Now this was a debating society for the socially progressive. It was self-proclaimed as a meeting place for those interested in new ideas. Sign me up for that. Carl Jung was a speaker here. Uh, the founders of the NAACP initially met here before they moved uptown. This uh, was a place for great minds. And many of the female members of the liberal club were also affiliated with what's known as the heterodoxy club. Now, this was a radical group founded by Marie Jenny Howe for women to gather safely and discuss unorthodox ideas. The first meeting was a luncheon. It was held at Polly's in 1912. And then it basically continu continued every other Saturday after, but at a rotation of super secret locations so that they wouldn't get caught. You see, these women believed in crazy stuff like like women wearing sandals or pants or working or God forbid voting. Um, so what? I know. That's just it's crazy. crazy. And uh, the yes, I've never heard of such a thing. I know, right? It's so radical. <laughs> and then we still fought that for that decades later. Isn't that crazy? But anyway, for just two dollars a year, Justin, if you're interested in changing your perspective on this, um, members Ooh. would be provided with loud talk and simple feasting. Women I were love loud home, talk, but not simple, simple feasting. feasting. Only complex feasting. Is that? <laughs> Right, right. Well, in addition talk, to loud feasting, yes. <laughs> loud feasting and simple talk. <laughs> we can change it up, yeah, for 2021. There's a sports bar that does that like every every Sunday afternoon. Right. <laughs> right. I think it's actually loud talk and loud, loud feasting, feasting for that one, though. Yeah. 
Maybe. Uh, but this was a place where women could come to, um, or Justins who want to change their minds, uh, and they could be at home with ideas. All could talk, all could argue, and most importantly, all could listen. Uh, now, heterodites, as they called themselves, they sought sanctuary to redefine what liberation meant for women on political, physical, and psychological levels. Um, in 1914, Howe also hosted two mass meetings for, uh, to introduce to a wider audience what the idea of feminism was. And she said, I love this, she said, we are sick of being specialized to our sex. We intend to simply be ourselves, not just our little female selves, but our whole big human selves. Ah. Speakers also included the likes of Emma Goldman, Helen Keller, Amy Lowell, Margaret Sanger, uh, Charlotte Perkins Gilman, whose writing actually inspired a lot of the women in this group, and Henrietta Rotman. Now, Henrietta Rodman is going to close out this location for us because she brought the liberal club to 137 McDougal Street. She was also the co-founder of the Feminist Alliance. She was at the forefront of the modern feminist agenda of the 19 teens. Uh, Floyd Dell even proclaimed that the village started with Henrietta Rodman. Margaret Sanger called her the feminist of feminists. She was a cool chick. By day, Henrietta Rodman was a school teacher. She, she taught English. And then by night, she was a bobbed bohemian feminist warrior. And where her battle began was naturally with the Board of Education, which she publicly challenged and denounced frequently. You see, at the time, women were working as teachers, but it wasn't easy for them. There was an actual marriage ban for female teachers. And if they did get married or have children, um, they would get pay cuts, they would get demoted, suspended, or in most cases fired due to neglect of duty. Now, Henrietta played a large role in advocating for the rights of these married teachers or these teacher mothers. And she actually at one point lost her own teaching position after publishing an article in the New York Tribune against the school for their mistreatment of the teacher mothers. She got her last word though. During her suspension, the Tribune actually hired her as their education columnist, and she took full advantage of the position. She used the platform to basically just tout the success of all the teacher mothers out there and also launch open attacks on her enemies and the school board's mistreatment of them, never giving up the good fight. Here, here, Henrietta. <laughs> and now I'm gonna leave you at 137 McDougal Street today, which is sadly just a wall. Uh, you can look it up. NYU owns this property. Uh, they did leave up the facing for Provincetown players, but there was a big fight uh, from the Village Preservation Society. Uh, and unfortunately, we did lose this space. So now, you know, many of us pass it every day, not realizing what dense revolutionary history lied behind those walls. But today we can take just a little moment to raise a glass to those who came before us there. And I think to do that, let's yeah stop the screen share and uh, and raise a, a glass for a, a, a toast. And, and Justin, I think you you found something appropriately fitting. You said, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's let's a uh, uh, toast. Um, there are many good reasons for drinking, and uh, one's just entered my head. If a man doesn't drink when he's living, how the hell can he drink when he's dead? Cheers. 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 Here. <laughs> And we're going to uh, go into our last two bars. But, you know, one of the things that's kind of fun about this, at least for us as guides, is we do, we, we meet a couple of times, we, we work, we kind of think through themes, we, we talk about some flows and stories, but we really kind of do our research in an isolated manner. So to a certain degree, some of the stuff we're actually hearing for the first time ourselves. And so it's kind of fun for us as, 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 your, as your hosts um, that we learn while you learn. Um, and I think that that's kind of a fun, unique aspect to it. And then, of course, afterwards, we'll go through and we'll correct all the stuff that we got wrong. Um, so far, that has not needed to happen yet. Um, and usually it's me who's got most of it wrong. But uh, I think we are now going to move into Rose's section, who once again, for the first time, is presenting with us. Uh, and I believe, Becca, you've taken control of our PowerPoint. And uh, Rose, please share with us what you have learned. One minute. She's getting prepared. No, got it. I had to get, I had to find a way to unmute myself because I have so many screens right now. Okay. Right. So yeah, see how smooth that was? We just switched SlideShare hosts and here we Amazing. go. So, uh, so next we're going to go just right down the street to a place called Eve's Hangout at 129 McDougal Street. So this was once a daring little speakeasy. 
Uh, it was short lived, but nevertheless, an influential gathering place. It became a haven in particular for lesbians, but many immigrants, members of the working class and intellectuals frequented the establishment. The proprietor, Ava Kutschever, organized many concerts and readings there, but it also became a safe space where women could talk about their love for other women, as well as political matters and liberal ideas. So Eve's has been described as a small, sparingly lit cellar that quickly became a destination among the city's bohemian contingents, artists, poets, activists, gay men, and lesbians. According to the Daily News, a local newspaper, it was rumored that men kept to one room, the women in another. And indeed, it's been speculated that a sign at the door read, men are admitted, but not welcome. So Kateva herself had adopted the anglicized name by this point, Eve Adams. She was born into a Jewish family in Poland and immigrated to the U.S. in 1912. She was rebellious by nature and by upbringing, and as a young woman befriended anarchists, sold left publications, and actually ran a lesbian and gay friendly speakeasy in Chicago first before moving on to New York. Before opening Eve's Hangout, she worked at a magazine called Mother Earth that you may have heard of before because it was run by the anarchist activist and writer Emma Goldman, someone we've also heard about earlier on this tour. Here's a photo of Emma looking like a particularly downright badass. Uh, but Adams herself wore pantsuits and sported an androgynous bob, leading others to describe her appearance as, quote, mannish. In New York, Adams frequented parties held by a woman named Edith Adams, where she mingled with the likes of, again, folks we've heard of before, Margaret Sanger, who many of you may know is the founder of the birth control movement, Elizabeth Gurley Flynn, a labor leader and feminist, the dirty penny that keeps turning up, Eugene O'Neill, <laughs> an author, and Sadakichi <laughs> Hartman. classic resting bitch face. I'm I know. Sorry. I'm sorry it's I always there. No, if you <laughs> Google search an image he's, he's of this man, not he's you not will mad. not get a different face. Yeah, it is just the same. Doesn't matter the age, plays, same resting bitch face. Uh, <laughs> and also Sadakichi Hartman, who was also a notable anarchist, art critic, and poet. Ben Lewis Reitman, a political ally of Adams, described the scene there as a training school for female roughneck anarchists, which I love. I feel like putting on my LinkedIn profile. I just really love that description. Now, despite the freewheeling spirit of the times, this was still a repressive era, and Adams' link to anarchists soon caught the attention of a young J. Edgar Hoover and the U.S. Bureau of Investigation. Due to Eve's reputation for hosting various subcultures, some conservative newspapers such as the Greenwich Village Quill began to denounce it. At the same time, Adams had risked it all in 1925 to write and publish a book titled Lesbian Love. The book, a collection of biographical snapshots of lesbians Adams had known, was a unique pioneering work unlike any other before it. It might actually be the first ethnography of lesbians in America. Structured as a series of vignettes, the book, which Adams described as a scientific literary contribution, captures scores of women who flirted, courted, or were in love with one another, and some who played with the presentations of their gender. It's important to note also that at this time, the word lesbian was only just beginning to shed its associations as a term invoked by the medical community actually to pathologize women who pursued same-sex relationships. For this reason, many actual lesbians were loath to adopt it, but Adams wanted to change this perception. She liked the word for the possibility it offered of making visible an identity and type of relationship that had no universal name. And although her vision of it may have been slightly narrower than ours, resembling what would come to be known as kind of butch, her adoption of it as a positive term was nonetheless revolutionary. 
Now, if you tried to find lesbian love in the years after it was published, you'd have a hard time. And that was in part by design. She printed just 150 copies, which were labeled for private circulation only. And she intended for the book for a limited audience of artists and poets of Greenwich Village who already had a vested interest in the subject matter. Limiting the, bu the book's reach was a protective strategy, but it also meant that it nearly vanished from the historical record. Nevertheless, all of these things came to a head on June 11, 1926, when Adams was arrested after providing an undercover female police officer with a copy of her book in an effort to impress her. Side note, if you were wondering, there were female police officers in New York in the 20s? Apparently there were. They were called, not at all condescendingly, the Flapper Squad. So moving right along, in a case that pitted US immigration officials and the New York City police against her, Adams was convicted of publishing a quote, obscene book and attempted sex with a policewoman, heaven forbid, whom it was found had been sent deliberately to entrap her. Side note, two of two, during Adams' confinement at the Women's Workhouse on Welfare Island, yes, that did exist. It is now Roosevelt Island in New York City's East River. She had a chance encounter with American actress Mae West, who was, would you believe it, charged with distribution of obscenities as a result of her Broadway play, Sex. West was similarly accused of, quote, corrupting the morals of youth. Welfare Island, to give you another historical reference point, is where fellow badass, Nellie Bly, first exposed the inhumanities of the island's mental health facilities. You can read about it in the book Damnation Island. Anyway, moving on. By the following year, 1927, Adams was deported back to Poland, where she described herself as a stranger Jew in her native country. She moved to France for 13 years, where she sold novels to American tourists on the streets to support herself. There are some silver linings during this time. In 1933, she met a Jewish singer named Nora Warren and lived with her even after Nora married a man. They intended to emigrate to Palestine and join her brother, but lacked the financial means. She also pleaded with her friend Ben Reitman to help her get a return permit to the U.S., alas, also without success. And in 1940, without other options, they moved to southern France. Now, unfortunately, Adams had an even more tragic end at this time. The Nazis soon occupied France. And despite her tireless work attempting to get out of the country, she was captured in 1943 and sent to Auschwitz, where she was murdered, along with millions of others. I realize this is a dark note to end things on, but all is not forgotten. Uh, this very year, 2021, Adam's story has been captured for the first time at full length. The book is called The Daring Times and Dangerous Life of Eve Adams by Jonathan Ned Katz. I encourage you to check it out if you have the chance. And I would also just point out this sign on the left is in Paris to this day to, commemor to commemorate Eve Adams and her time there. Hmm. So uh, in the bar talked about so far, we have seen how they not only provide a place for artists to gather, talk, drink, and share ideas, but also for people who through one reason or another don't quite fit in. These establishments evolved to fill a need by becoming neutral ground where people with fringe passions could feel accepted and more free to express themselves. Today, like-minded folks might find each other in themed bars of the village, such as the Slaughtered Lamb or Jekyll and Hyde. But the invention of themed bars is not a recent one, is it, Justin? It is not a recent one, it's true. Uh, so in researching uh, the next bar that we're gonna be talking about, um, I thought I'd find an appropriate quote to sort of kick things off. And so I found and chose one from Blackbeard the Pirate, who, according to one website, apparently said, once said, let's jump on the boat and cut them to pieces, which really is not so much a quote now that I realize it as much as it, as it is a direct threat. Um, however, it might be exactly the kind of thing you might overhear uh, at a place uh, that existed in New York called the Pirate's Den. So a man named Don Dickerman opened uh, his first pirate-themed establishment called the Pirate's Cave at 133 Washington Place in the basement below the offices for a magazine called the Ink Pot. Uh, it started out as a tea room um, in 1917, 
So like a real tea room, because prohibition was not for another two years, uh, mostly for displaying Dickerman's paintings and handcrafted toys. He soon, however, saw that uh, there was a much greater uh, uh, entertainment potential for, for such a, a, a themed sort of place. So by March 1918, Dickerman moved over to 8 Christopher Street in an 1849 three-story former stable where he and, a, and another partner opened a second pirate establishment. That was the, the Pirate's Den. Uh, that's the location where most of the history took place. Uh, the top floor, incidentally, as a side note, is also apparently where Dr. Seuss lived for a time um, in 1927 ab above the bar. Um, today, the old Pirate's Den now houses the popular bar Pieces. It's the same building. Don Dickerman was born in Illinois in 1893. After attending Anover and Yale, he came to Manhattan to study at the New York Art School, where he roamed, uh, roamed, roomed um, with a young Norman Rockwell. He and Norman Rockwell were good friends. Uh, he married, Don Dickerman married 13 times, uh, proudly noting it was one more wife than Blackbeard had. Apparently, um, yeah, he was in some sort of weird competition with Blackbeard. Yeah, he was uh, a real Dickerman. catch. <laughs> yeah, right. Right. Seriously. Uh, Dickerman. Uh, so he was he was a nut for pirates. Uh, he could typically be seen tromping through the West Village dressed with an eye patch, a gold hoop earrings and a billowy blouse tied up with a sash. He really dressed like this all the time. He started a not quite successful movement to get Captain William Kidd posthumously pardoned by the mayor of New York. Um, he also once purchased a five masted schooner to hunt for buried treasure in Nova Scotia, but he failed to obtain uh, backing for the trip. And throughout his life, he collected antique pirate maps, uh, cutlasses, blunderbuss, various cannon. Um, pirating was like his whole thing. Um, so it was uh, late in the 1910s that Dickerman turned from art to restauranteering, opening a series of gaudy themed eateries in the West Village. So uh, more, other than the pirate den, there was the, the Blue Horse, where diners ate in stalls and orchestra and the, and the orchestra uh, wore blinders. Uh, the village barn on 8th Street had square dancing patrons, yodeling waiters, and nightly turtle races. And uh, he also owned some, uh, a place called the County Fair, the Big Apple, the Daffy Dill, and the Hi-Ho Club. And to get from one end of his weird themed empire to the other, bouncing from uh, uh, a nightclub to nightclub, uh, Dickerman would hire an ambulance with loud sirens to cut through traffic. Um, so I mentioned the Hi-Ho Club. Uh, one night when uh, an ensemble um, came in to try out for a, a gig to play there, uh, Captain Don, as uh, he preferred to be called, watched the performance and was less impressed with the singer. Uh, the band saxophonist got desperate and decided to sing a song in the last chance effort so uh, the band could get a job. Uh, nightclubs, um, his, his voice, the saxophonist's, uh, was like soft, silky, and smooth and melodious, not the kind of voice you'd hear in, in loud nightclubs uh, before the electric microphone. So he picked up a megaphone and sang into that. When the song was over, Captain Don said, you do the singing and gave the band the job. That saxophone player was Rudy Valley, a young Rudy Valley. And so before long, a radio station was broadcasting live out of the Hi-Ho Club and Rudy became a sensation. Uh, Rudy was the first person to popularize the form of singing known as crooning, basically paving the way uh, for people such as Bing Crosby, Frank, uh, Bing Crosby, Frank Sinatra, and Elvis Presley. Um, so jumping back to the pirate's den, Don dressed, not only was he dressed as a pirate, but he dressed his doorman, waiters, musicians, everybody as high seas sailing buccaneers while decorating the bar with cutlasses and ship rigging and clanking chains, uh, ship's lanterns, other pirate themed stuff. And for a 75 cent cover charge or a dollar on Saturdays, an eye patched host would lead you through three candlelit decks of the restaurant, um, basically the main deck, the gun deck and the hurricane deck. And each was designed to simulate a massive pirate ship. He would seat you at a table with a treasure map for a tablecloth and hand you a menu. Meanwhile, an orchestra played from a large freight elevator that perpetually was moving up and down between the three decks. Um, a, a 1925 guide to Greenwich Village written and edited by the writer Anna, Anna Alice Chapin um, recalls, quote, it is the most perfect pirate's den you can imagine. On the walls hang uh, 
hung huge casks and kegs of, and wine bottles uh, in their straw covers. The pirate who serves you, incidentally, he writes poetry and helps to edit a magazine, among other things, apologizes for the lack of a Stevensonian pirate. Uh, a chap we know is going to bring one back from the South Sea Islands, he declares seriously, and we're going to teach it to say pieces of eight, pieces of eight. Um, the pirate's den never got that particular parrot, but it did have a 100 year old Panamanian macaw named Robert that cursed at customers while servers staged mock battles where uh, female patrons would be abducted and then they would be held in the brig, uh, basically a room, uh, until they screamed, at which point they were then released with a scream diploma. Uh, the police raided the pirate's den twice. Once in 1921 for conducting, uh, this was the, the charge, conducting a pleasure resort without a dancing license. You had to have a dancing license at the time. Um, and again in 1923 for allowing his staff to carry deadly weapons. Prohibition agents, however, ignored the pirate's den because it never sold anything harder than a cold sarsaparilla. So uh, the, the Christopher Street location uh, succumbed to a fire in April of 1929, completely destroyed the building. Thousands of dollars in pirate mem memorabilia were gone. Um, it killed uh, no less than 15 cats. We have a clear record of how many cats it killed. Uh, and several birds, uh, including, sadly, the foul-mouthed uh, Robert. Uh, a few months later, after the fire, the stock market crashed, and so Dickerman was forced to sell this location and then declare bankruptcy in 1932. He claimed only owning uh, a few suits of clothes three or four years old. Um, he then, uh, Don then took his buccaneering concept to some other cities, including Miami, uh, Washington, D.C., and then in 1940 in Los Angeles at at exactly at 335 North La Brea, um, which, which today is where the Bob Hope Health Center uh, is. Um, and it was, it's interesting that, that's, that it's the Bob Hope Health Center because it was also co-owned that location by Bob Hope, uh, Rudy Valley, and Bing Crosby, among others. Yeah. Uh, at his prime, Captain Don owned 27 themed clubs all across the nation. And now Eric... Will uh, will down an entire bottle of rum <laughs> like a real pirate. Okay, Eric. All the while, while 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 singing a sea shanty at the same time, it's this incredible thing he can do. Well, I don't have a sea shanty, but I do have I do have one more toast that I wanted to share um, because it brings back a little bit of fond memories, and it's a little piratey, I guess. Um, ho ho ho! To the bottle I go to heal my heart and drown my woe. Rain may fall and wind may blow, and many miles be still to go. But under a tall tree will I lie and let the clouds go sailing by. And that is, of course, by J.R.R. Tolkien, which I have to say is one of the books that really changed what literature and reading was for me as a child. Uh, and I actually owe it to my mother. Um, I used to read a lot of the Frog and Toad books were some of the first books that I really could read by myself for the first time. And I kind of read. Yeah, those are good. Yeah, they are. I'm reading them now. They're, I love I love Frog and Toad. Oh, yeah, Frog and Toad are the best. I kind of want to mount yeah. it as a play. I know there's a stage version. I kind of want to do my own version of it. It's it's oh, there's <laughs> a musical. I was in the musical yeah. at the at Penobscot. Yeah, it's so good. That's I, awesome. I, I, are, we about, <laughs> are we talking about it. Wind in the Willows or or is this a different thing? It's a different is thing, it but it's that same idea. It's you know, oh. anthropomorphized anthropomorphized animals that talk and yeah. more clothes like it um is, is basically the, the sense of it but um i was bored and you know i, I don't even know if my brother was born yet or not and and i want something different to read and my mom said well here why don't you try this book it was the hobbit and um oh that changed my life and changed everything i read and i probably read i probably read that every year until i was about 30 and then i just finally reread it for the first time in maybe 10 years this past year during the pandemic and it still holds up but uh if you're wondering why I keep bringing up my, my mother is because my mortgage is due tomorrow. Now, I wanted to do one last quick bar. Um, but before I did there, I just think it's really interesting to think about like this eclectic collection of pubs that we've covered in our Bohemian Rhapsody. Speakeasies to feminist literary tea rooms, anarchist feminist theater hangouts, uh, politically fire-branded lesbian speakeasies, and pirates. Um, kind of got to love New York and you got to love the village and it's, it's hard not to get drawn back to just how fascinating and inspiring and somewhat envious the history of, of Greenwich Village is. And, and even though it's become a bit of a theme park, it feels like these days and with all the different tours and it, it's a little bit of the Times Square of bohemianism, uh, it, it really was a unique and inspiring area. And this last bar 
it's a little bit further forward in time into the 1930s. But I feel like it's, it's, the, it's the true culmination of what a bar could be that could only really happen in the village when you think of, of all of its, of its history and, and uh, political thought and, and creativity and inspiration and, and literature. And it, and it starts on December 18th in 1938. Because apparently a man in his mid-30s with no experience running a club decided that she, he should open and run a club. Um, his name was Barney Josephson, and the man in question opened the Cafe Society, along with the producer John Hammond. Um, and his intention, he claimed, was, was to sort of form a club that was steering away from a lot of the norms at the time, where clubs tended to be mob-controlled, stuffy, and segregated. And so his was apparently none of the three. Uh, he later said, I wanted a club where blacks and whites worked together and behind the footlights, but also sat together out front. I don't think that there was at that time any place in New York and possibly the whole country. The claim was that it was the very first integrated bar where uh, it was a mixed, it, a mixed group, both on stage and on the other side of the footlights in the audience. Now, uh, while it's claimed to be the first, I believe Small's Paradise in Harlem actually holds that title. I think they, they, they kind of mixed their segregation, mixed, mixed their, their groups. They segregate. They came together in front uh, a little bit earlier. But it was a very iconic jazz club in the village. Uh, it was influential for performers in the audience. And for the first nine months, they had a headliner uh, who, who just became this, this magnitude of, of epic jazz singing. Uh, at the time, she was, she was a young lady. She'd been working the, with the club's co-founder, John Hammond, for a while. Uh, she was a jazz singer and a club singer in Harlem. She'd been singing a little for Count Basie. Um, she'd had a small role in a Duke Ellington film and was performing a new song, uh, a powerful, heavy-handed song, uh, a vitally important song like no other. Uh, and for nine months, the singer and the song became the highlight of the club. Now, this song was so inspiring that Josephine actually came up with a series of rules around it. Uh, it would always be the last song of the night. Uh, the wait staff would stop serving drinks right before the song. The entire place would go dark except for a spotlight on her, and there would never be an encore. The, uh, the singer was Billie Holiday, and the song was Strange Fruit. Now, if you're not familiar with the song Strange Fruit, it's a very beautiful but haunting song that's referencing the, the sort of long and tragic history of, of lynchings in American South. Um, now, it was written originally as a poem by a Bronx Jewish school teacher by the name of Abel Mirapol. Um, and he had written the poem as a bit of a sort of a, a, a revolutionary poem called Bitter Fruit. Uh, it became a staple of left wing rallies. It was sung by his wife for a while until uh, a woman named Laura Duncan found the song, performed it at Madison Square Garden, and that's where it came to the attention to the producer of the Cafe Society. They passed the song on to Billie Holiday, and the first time that she was going to sing it at the Cafe Society, she was very nervous. Despite the fact that this was allegedly a progressive audience, it was still the late 1930s. Uh, and she even said that um, after she sang the song, there wasn't even a patter of applause when I finished. Then a lone person began to clap nervously, and then everybody was clapping and it became the staple song of her career. Josephine explained the reason for the rules of the song with no service, the dimming of the lights, no encore, is that he said people had to remember Strange Fruit to get their insides burned by it. Um, at New York's Birdland, the promoter confiscated cigarettes because he was worried that the glowing cigarettes would distract from the song and the lighting. Some places thought that the song was a little too risque, a, a little too adversarial, um, and, and opening things that they didn't want their audiences to feel uncomfortable about. So they tried to ban the song and she made it a clause in every contact, contract moving forward that she had the right to sing it should she choose. But she didn't always. She said in an interview once, she said, this, this is for people who would understand and appreciate it. This is not a June moon croon tune. Uh, a little shout out to Rudy Valley and the crooning. The song was a gift, but it was also a curse. It's said that she came under FBI's radar because of that song, which got the attention of our friend J. Edgar Hoover, who was not pleased. And it wasn't long before her, her, her struggles with drug addictions got the attention of the head agent, also a friend and co-worker of Mr. Hoover, uh, narcotics Henry Ainsling, Ainslinger, Ainslinger. I can't, I'm from Maine, lobster, Bryn Mauer, Aslinger. He was, he was, I mean, he was a real, this guy was a class act. Uh, he was great. He, he looked over the scene filled with rebels like Charlie Parker and Louis Armstrong and Thelonious Monk. And as the journalist Larry Sloman recorded, he longed to see them all behind bars. 
And without wanting to go into details, um, his, his push was fairly racially motivated. He's got some truly horrendous quotes about marijuana, jazz, race, and interracial dating. Um, and uh, it's, it's some real great stuff, but you can look that up on your own. Uh, but he did write to all his agents. He said, please prepare all cases in your jurisdictions involving musicians in violation of marijuana laws. Um, his advice on drug raids to his men was always simple. Shoot first. Now, as you can see, he had a bit of a burr up his butt about this wacky tobacco and the crazy demonic rage that would possess its users, which is, of course, why so many of these hippie drum circles at music festivals were also known as bloodbath factories. Because of the rage of marijuana. Now, there are some signs that you might see if somebody is in the midst of a demonic craze of marijuana. Um, but... Billie Holiday did struggle with drug addiction. In fact, she never was formally educated. She grew up in the real rough streets of, of Baltimore and, and they said that that, that, real, that hard life was something that she was able to evoke so beautifully in her songs. But uh, Ains Ainslinger was able to get arrested, prosecuted and put in jail in a matter of two weeks after setting her up on a, on a drug charge. Now, there, there are all sorts of other people who came to the Cafe Society. Um, uh, patrons like Lena Horne performed there, Teddy Wilson, Langston Hughes was a regular. Dashiell Hammett, uh, Eleanor Roosevelt went there. Uh, Richard Wright was a regular, Count Basie, Duke Ellington, Jack Guilford. And of course, the comedian that was often Milton Berle's stooge in the bits uh, that they say, um, Jack Guilford here, which I think is a click advance. All right, Jack, come over there, got a click. Ah, Jack, you might recognize him. Um, one of those classic comedic actors. Um, but as you can see, uh, the cafe, like so many of the great pubs in the village, the clientele was an eclectic gathering of music, literature, art, political thought, all exploring and sharing the human condition. And I love this photo that's about to, uh, oops, I think we unpacked it right here, just showing that one Sheridan Square in 1939 and 1923. Um, and with that moment, I think we'll stop sharing and say thank you so much for joining us again on this on this tour. Um, you know, Becca said something in, in a rehearsal that I thought was was very, very astute at one point. She said, like, one of the connecting themes with all of these bars is that they were the right place for the wrong people. And I like that frame. I, I've seen that phrase articles. In fact, I saw an article about the Cafe Society and other clubs like it that was called the, the wrong place for the right people. But I think, I think you have it right, Becca. It was the right place for the wrong people, people who did not fit the mold of the norms of middle class and upper class sensibilities of their times. Uh, the, and the thing that they shared is they were iconic water, watering holes. Uh, they, were, they were breaking barriers, expanding minds, and they were celebrating American culture and camaraderie in the one place you can in the American pub. So cheers and thank you. Thank you very much for joining us today. Oh, well, we did get one question that came up um, about how did Eugene when he'll have time to write all that stuff always seem to be drinking everywhere. And that is an excellent, excellent question, but probably why so much of what he wrote about was set in a bar. Um, and most of those bars were actually in Greenwich Village. Several of Anna Christie, yep. there's a lot, a lot of stuff set in the bar. Uh, obviously, Esme Cometh <laughs> was set in a, in a former bar in the village. So he managed to bring his love together, basically, exactly. right? That's what it's all about. Inspiring. <laughs> I think we're going to work on a world tour of literary bars around the globe. That's aggressive, Eric. That's a lot. <laughs> that's like a food. seminar. <laughs> that's right. It's a 14 day tour. 14 right? days. Exactly. <laughs> Get a comfy chair, <laughs> order out. That's right. And sit Don't back. think about showering. That's yeah. right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Where's the bathroom again, Eric? Down it's, it's, down the the <laughs> it's down the house. Yeah. It's down the house. Down there. After Chumley's, I, I definitely missed going to the White Horse, not only because of pandemic, but when the when when they changed owners and then changed the decor de, decor. Oh, I've I've got your disease now, Eric. I'm having trouble pronouncing stuff. Did you also and then, go to um, College? <laughs> it's possibly. <laughs> um and uh, yeah, and and the clientele changed and everything. Once again, all the all the old guys who sat around the bar that we would always walk in and say hi to, gone. I was um, reading an article and it was about 1916, complaining about what had changed in the village and how the, the culture had changed and all the people had changed. And I've seen that in the 1905 article with somebody complaining about, you know, all the new young people that are moving into the village and ruining the scene that used to be there. And, and it's, I mean, it's, it's true nationwide, like things change and we're all, we, we see it in so many aspects of society. Like we, we naturally look fondly back on our youths 
and we look back at those experiences and and when we see those things go away i mean i, I wonder if part of that psychology is because it's like it really is closing the door on, on on our past and 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 facing that reality that you know it's not just our world anymore and, and it is it's somebody else and and you know this 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 theme about how the young people are you know their values are wrong and they're becoming weak and that i mean this is this is a 1500 year old theme i mean the greeks complained about it in the year 08 bc i mean it's 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 an ongoing thing but i think there is something because we have that nostalgia and 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 you know i mean the reason why i I spent a reasonable amount of money on these pictures is because we you know those memories are important to us and when those memories are gone and when those changes in the scene change it's, it's hard not to be a little bit bitter you know, you feel like you if it's any that. consolation, Eric, Becca and I are forming Heterodoxy Club 2.0 this year, Perfect. 2021, because apparently yes. we still need it, guys. Old ideas, new times. I think that's our tour. I mean, as, as much as I get tired of the Zoom fatigue, the fact that we can start pushing live on YouTube, that we can start um, using this as an opportunity to go into greater themes and really dig deeper into research that we don't always have time to share. So thank you for sharing this evening with us. I know we are nearing the end of a pandemic that we're not quite through, but we are in it together. Uh, and I hope that that theme of being in it together can be something that we can remember and hold on to, both remember it now because we are in it together now. Uh, and I hope that we remain in it together in the future. But I do, I do appreciate that you spent a little of that time together with us today. So cheers. Yes. Thank you very much. Thanks for joining us, everybody. I feel like the theme music and credits should go through now. <laughs> it's true. We need a curtain. Close we off. need to like, a, yeah, we all, we all just <laughs> fade out. Bye. Wave to everyone. <laughs> <laughs> as long as we amuse ourselves more than we amuse anyone else, that's what that's what's important. See, I would I will say one other thing. You guys can go, Eric. Just, just yeah, I'm just talking my own. Just yeah, yeah. Eric's just talking. This happens all the time. <laughs> Bye, Eric. <laughs> <laughs> Watching, Eric. Take care. Bye. Bye. See you guys. I'm going to do it.